afternoon, everybody. I got uh, quite a few things here at the top, so if you'll just bear with me. Um, first on uh, former Secretary Clinton's emails, at about 9 o'clock tonight, the State Department will make publicly available online approximately 3,000 additional pages of emails from former Secretary Clinton's email account. These emails were reviewed using Freedom of Information Act standards for release, as they all have been. The Department acknowledges the significant interest in these documents, and we're releasing them in further demonstration of our commitment to transparency, a commitment Secretary Kerry has made very, very clear to all of us. The total page count of documents released to date meets a goal set by a court ruling whereby the Department is to aspire to the release of 7 percent of the total number of pages of these documents by today's date. I know that 9 o'clock is a fairly inconvenient time for many of you in the media, um, and I certainly apologize for the inconvenience that that's going to cause, but I can assure you, and I want to make it very clear from the outset, that a 9 o'clock release date is not deliberately intended to make your life harder. Um, I know that's going to be the going assumption, uh, but it is absolutely not the case. Uh, we worked very, very hard um, to try to reach this 7 percent goal. We're working right up to the deadline. Um, and I can tell you that there were many conversations here yesterday to try to see if we could move that time to the left and just it's a matter of physics and time and there's just no way to get it done earlier. So uh, just let me make that very clear. Uh, I know it's not uh, ideal for you. It's not ideal for us either. Um, but you're just going to have to bear with us and, uh, uh, and we'll keep it and keep the process going. Um, Secondly, um, as you may have seen, uh, Brazilian President uh, Dilma Rousseff visited the White House uh, earlier today, just completed a press conference uh, with President Obama. She is now here at the State Department um, uh, meeting with D Deputy Secretary Blinken and Vice President Biden. Um, and uh, they're, in fact, they're uh, upstairs uh, having a, a luncheon discussion uh, as we speak, and I expect that they'll be talking about a full range of issues, much like we're discussed uh, um, at the White House on uh, uh, how we can deepen our economic trade and commercial ties. I also want to offer our heartfelt condolences to the Indonesian people today, especially those in the city of Medan, where a C-130 military aircraft crashed earlier today. Um, as we understand it and reports are still coming in, I would certainly point to the Indonesian authorities to speak more. Uh, specifically about the accident, but as we understand it, there were certain, there were casualties on the ground as well as in the aircraft. So again, our hearts and uh, and uh, prayers go out to, to to the people of Indonesia. They remain strong friends and partners, and we stand ready to assist the government of Indonesia with the investigation as needed. As you've also probably uh, seen today, uh, the P5 plus one in Iran have decided to extend the measures under the joint plan of action until July 7th to allow more time for negotiations to reach a long-term solution on the Iran nuclear issue. This is a simple technical extension. Working towards a final deal today, the Secretary met with Foreign Minister Zarif as well as Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov, and all the experts continue to meet as we work to conclude a deal. We'll continue to update you as things progress over the coming days. And then two, two other uh, personnel announcements, and then uh, we'll turn it over. Um, Today, Secretary Kerry announced the appointment of Lee Woleski to the position of Special Envoy for Guantanamo Closure. Special Envoy Woleski's appointment reflects the administration's commitment to closing the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay. He brings a wealth of experience as an accomplished litigator and pragmatic problem solver, a skill set that will prove valuable as he serves as the lead negotiator for the transfer of Guantanamo detainees abroad and manages the multi multitude of diplomatic issues related to the President's directives to close the detention facility there, as well as implement transfer determinations and conduct periodic reviews of those detainees who are not approved for transfer. And then finally, I just want to make, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that today is Jeff Rathke's last day here at the State Department. Um, it, uh, it's a very bittersweet day for us to say goodbye to him. You all know Jeff, you know what a professional he is how calm and cool and collected he is up here, um, even in the face of just bitter scrutiny um, <laughs> and sometimes ridiculous questions. Uh, those were Jeff's words, not mine. I, 
<laughs> just before I came out here. Um, but Jeff's a dedicated, has been a dedicated uh, career foreign service officer. And I, uh, I know I'm speaking for Mark when I say that both of us have relied heavily on his advice and counsel in just the last few weeks as we've been trying to get up to speed. And Jeff, we're really going to miss you, and we wish you well. As uh, we say in the Navy, fair winds and following seas. So thanks. Okay, with that, you're, Yeah, Catherine here, Joe at Fox News. I have a couple of follow-ups on the emails. Um, just so I'm clear, are you still working on clearing more emails at this hour in advance of the 9 o'clock uh, deadline? It's a continuous process. Okay. Remember now we had 55,000 pages to go through 30-some, 30 30,000-some 30, odd emails. So that's a continual process. But the focus today is really going right. to be on getting these ready. If I could just follow up again uh, on that. When they're posted to the website, they're not posted in a chronological order. Is it going to be possible to do this because it would have more ease in understanding the traffic? Or is this a reflection of how you're receiving these emails from Mrs. Clinton? It's not a, it's, I don't think it's a function of how they're being, how they're in receipt. Um, and they're going to be posted in a very similar format to the last time. Um, so but that was a confused format. That, I mean, it was dates all over the place, re right? Recognize that. But you also have to understand sometimes, you know, <laughs> as you all know, in the use of email, I mean, um, there's forwards, there's replies all over a, a spectrum of time. So they'll be in the same format. Recognize the inconvenience of that, but that they'll be in the same format. Um, and I'm sorry, you had another... Bit. I did have a follow-up. What we found uh, in the last batch of emails is that there were some pretty significant discrepancies between what was released by the State Department and what was released to the Select Committee. For example, in April 2011, there's an email from Mrs. Clinton indicating that she was uh, in support of using private security contractors to arm the Libyan opposition, which was not legal at that time for the U.S. government to do it. Um, that line was redacted from the public email released by the State Department, but it was intact in the email that was released to the Select Committee. Well, I don't, uh, I can't speak to specific emails that the Select Committee might have that may or may not be in this tranche. Let me go back to try to, because uh, okay. back to your chronological question. So the, the tranche that will be released tonight is roughly includes emails from about March to December of 2009. So. There is some chronological order to the process itself. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of going through time. Inside the tranche, I can't guarantee that they're all going to be lined up exactly by date and time. I also want to say that just because this tranche is, say, March to the end of 2009, doesn't mean in the next tranche you may not see emails that are from April or May also of 2009. I mean, uh, we're doing the best we can to keep them bundled that way, but it's difficult with, with the sheer volume of it. To your other question, I, 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 uh, again, we can't speak for inventories of email traffic that other people may provide the select committee or other sources they may get to it. We can only work with what we were given. And uh, in these 55,000 pages, that's, that's our task, is to go through and redact them, uh, redact them and prepare them through the Freedom of Information Act process. Um, but so, and, and, and monopolize it, but, but this was the same email provided by the State Department to the Select Committee. So it's the same document. I'm yeah. just wondering why it would be redacted in the public version but not in the Select Committee version because it's a very important statement that she was interested in using private contractors to arm the rebels at that time. I, I can't speak to that particular issue in email, mm -hmm. ma'am. I just don't. Right. have the, the depth of knowledge on yeah. that particular mm -hmm. note. But I can tell you, there, it, it, is, it is not uncommon, again, not speaking to this case specifically, it's not uncommon that for us to release documents to Congress mm -hmm. that have a different, there's a different set of standards sometimes in terms of the kind of information that can be included mm -hmm. in correspondence with Congress than you would put, uh, mm -hmm you know, for public mm -hmm. consumption on a Freedom of Information sure. Act website. There's, and that's, what I, that's why I stressed it at the outset, saying that these were all redacted mm -hmm. and organized and reviewed through the Freedom of Information Act process. So I can't mm -hmm. discount the fact that in the future, right. with this or any other mm -hmm. tranche, that there may be documents that are redacted differently sure. for going to the Hill than they are on, online. This is my sense? final question because I don't want to monopolize it further, but the 2009 emails that are re being released today are really about the furthest distance away of relevance from the terrorist attack itself. Well, remember, don't confuse these two things. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, we are working with the select committee mm -hmm. that's investigating mm -hmm. the Benghazi attack. And 
in cooperating with them, mm -hmm. we have not only produced witnesses for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for briefings that they've needed or wanted, but we've also produced thousands and thousands of pages of documents to include some documents from these emails. That's separate and distinct from the task at hand, which is to make public all 55,000 okay, so. mm -hmm. pages of emails, which m the, the vast majority have nothing to do with the work right. of the Select Committee. So those are two separate processes. Got it. On. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let's Thank you. Sure. Does anyone else have an email? No. Sure. Yeah. Are you a bit concerned that releasing this glut of documents at 9 o'clock will seem like something done under cover of night? I mean, it does seem like an odd time to release yeah. documents. Were you, I don't know if you were here when I opened up the press conference. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I, was. I, I, I was very clear. I tried to make it very clear that this is a really a function of physics for us. I mean, there's a lot of emails to get through. We have a deadline we have to meet. Uh, and it's, we're doing everything we can to reach that 7% goal um, for release as ordered by the, the court. So that's what's driving the time. I recognize it's inconvenient for you and the media. But it's not a question of and convenience I, of a question I recognize of the perception. optics. No, yeah. I, I, I recognize that too, as I said at the opening. I can assure you that this is not an attempt or an effort to, uh, to try to be less than open and forthcoming or to try to, you know, uh, steer away from news coverage of this. Uh, we recognize it's an inconvenient time. We know the, we know the difficulty of put, posting it on, online at that, at that hour. Um, uh, I could tell you that if we had our way, we, we would post it earlier. But we have a deadline. We have to meet it. There's a lot of work between now and, and 9 o'clock this evening, and we're just going to keep at it. To Catherine's question, that's our focus today, is really to drive at that and, and meet that goal. Again, recognize it's not the greatest time of day to do it. Um, but it's simply, we simply have no choice today. But Admiral, in this perception that you are, are scrambling to this deadline at 9 o'clock, that you're still working, that this presumably could have been done in the last few days. We've been, there's been nothing but nearly nonstop work on this, Lucas, uh, you know, since the last tranche was released. You have to understand the enormity of the task here. Okay. It, it is a lot of stuff to go through. <laughs> and it's not just the... It's not just the, the volume of material, it's making sure that, again, to my answers to Catherine, that, that they're released properly, that the right redactions are made, that, that we respect the Freedom of Information Act. And, and we're going to do that. And we'd rather be right, you know, than be early. And so while we all recognize that turning in our homework at 9 o'clock the night before, <laughs> you know, is, is probably not You've ideal. You've never done that, though, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure nobody's <laughs> ever done that. Yeah. Uh, we recognize it's not ideal, but it, it, it's just the reality that we're working with today. And, and, uh... Uh, Trey Gowdy on Capitol Hill has said he wanted uh, Secretary Kerry to appear before his uh, select committee to discuss uh, these emails. Would the secretary be made available for that? I don't believe that's exactly what the congressman said. He said if if he got to that point, you know, he would make that he would make that request. And um, I'm not going to speak to a hypothetical request that hasn't come in yet. What I will repeat, and I think is important to say, is Secretary Kerry has been very clear with all the leadership here at the State Department that we're going to be as cooperative as possible with the Select Committee on, on their task. And uh, he respects it, and we're, we're working very diligently to try to produce documents that meet their needs. I also have said uh, that the, the more the requests for information expand, you know, beyond the original mandate of, of Benghazi-related material, the harder that, not the harder, but the, the longer it's going to take and the more resources it's going to consume here. So. We're working very hard. Again, there's two processes here. Right. There's trying to right. meet the needs of the select committee and trying to make public 55,000 pages of email. And uh, would Secretary, former Secretary Clinton's former aide, uh, Uma Abedin's emails be available as well? Uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to get into content here uh, for tonight. I think we'll just have to wait till they get online and you can go through them and look for yourself. I'm going to scrupulously avoid speaking to the content while we're still processing these and getting them ready to go online. Sure. Are we done on the email thing? Okay. I want to talk about the Iran talks. I know you've got a team there, and um, so have we. Um, but I just want to be clear. You said the extension was technical, but can you give us a sense um, how, how these talks are going? Does um, uh, Foreign Minister Zarif came back today. There was mm -hmm. a sense that maybe he hadn't come back with everything. Um, uh, is there a feeling that you can make, perhaps, um, you know, make this deal happen by the 7th? 
or at least by the deadline of the 8th or the 9th before it goes into that 60-day extension um, under the Corker Bill? Well, it's a lot, there's a lot in there, Leslie. I, I won't speak for uh, Foreign Minister Zarif for uh, his trip back home and, and what he came back with. As I said, he met with Secretary Kerry today uh, upon his return. I'm told it was a, uh, a productive meeting, but I, I don't have more beyond that, and I, and I wouldn't uh, speculate. Um, I think this extension to the 7th is really to extend the relief period under the Joint Plan of Action. It is, as I said, a, t a, 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 temp a technical extension. It's like going into extra innings here, okay, in the same game. Um, and uh, what I can also say then, you know, thirdly, is that our focus remains on trying to reach a deal. And, uh, and that's where, and that, the, the work inside the negotiating room is on trying to resolve the differences that are still outstanding. Again, I won't speak to the specifics of all those differences, uh, but there, there, there does remain, uh, uh, there, there, there are differences on, on some issues, and again, they're working, uh, they're working through that. Secretary Kerry is also very pragmatic and clear-eyed about this, though, um, and uh, as I think you heard the President say, certainly Secretary Kerry has said it before, that no deal is better than a bad deal. So it's not about it, the, the – I don't – you know, the extension is – it's in a, it, it's important because it provides a little extra breathing space, but nobody's under any illusions or trying to, you know, race to, uh, you know, uh, that day as, as sort of, you know, uh, got to have it. It's it, we could get it. We could get a deal in two days, three days. We could get a deal on the seventh, or we could get no deal at all. That's always a possibility too. Would you say that there's still huge gaps um, remaining, or do you think that those gaps have now been narrowed, um, you know, over the last week or so? I'm going to steer away from adjectives. There are gaps remaining. There are still uh, things that need to be. Uh, worked out and fleshed out between the negotiating teams. Uh, they're working on that now, but I'm going to refrain from describing them or characterizing them. Yes? Uh, do you have to say anything on the suicide attack in Kabul, Afghanistan? Uh, how do you see the security situation there? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're certainly aware of the at attack that, that occurred uh, in Kabul. Um, and uh, I think our embassy had a statement out there condemning it, obviously. Uh, the, the, the violence. Um, Do you know who was uh, injured in the attack? I don't. Um, there were no U.S. personnel uh, injured uh, in the attack. Um, no, co uh, no coalition forces uh, were injured from the attack. The other thing I'd say is, as we've seen this before, the Afghan National Security Forces responded ably to this. Um, and uh, quickly as well, uh, and so that's you know, that's another sign, another indication that they continue to improve their capability of, uh, to defend their own people. They're not large-scale attacks, but it seems as if the Taliban or those who are sympathetic with the Taliban are launching on a regular basis these kinds of attacks in the capital city. What does that say to you about the Afghan security forces' overall control? of the security situation in the country, and is that an area where U.S. forces are going to have to give them additional training, perhaps help them recruit more people in order to uh, keep these attacks from happening? Well, let's take a step back. I mean, it's summertime. Mm -hmm. Not unusual or atypical for us to see uh, more Taliban attacks, uh, not just in Kabul but elsewhere in Afghanistan during the summertime. Um, so this is not altogether atypical. Um, I don't have trend analysis here for it. I tell you, you know, it's more this month than it was this month last year. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think we need to keep it in perspective. Uh, the, these attacks have n uh, not been ultimately successful. Uh, they've been executed, that's for sure. But uh, the effect has been minimal on the people of Kabul and the government uh, uh, of Afghanistan. Um, and I think, back to my previous answer, looking at the response of the Afghan National Security Forces, the speed with which they got on scene and the efficiency with which they dealt uh, with the attackers, I think, shows that the training and assistance that we've been giving them has been effective. So, again, I would point you to the Defense Department to speak to specific military matters, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't think anybody here thinks that Today's attack, or the one last week against the Parliament building, 
would imply that we need to make some sort of major muscle movement in changing the way Afghan national security forces uh, are being trained, advised, and assisted. Um, and and I, the last point to your question, I think, is important to remind people that they are providing security for their country. It is the, the mission is theirs now, and we are in an advisory and assist capacity only. But they are they are defending their territory. They are defending their citizens. And I might add that they're doing it. They're doing it quite ably. Are you worried by the fact that there were few several Afghans, local Afghans, who were uh, shouting slogans against the Americans and targeting the American soldiers who were present there? At least one American soldier was injured in the incident too uh, at the incident site. In today's? Yes. I've got no reports that suggest, in fact, quite the opposite, that there was any American casualties as a result of today's attack. Okay. I have. I've, Everything, all the reporting I've seen indicates there were no U.S. casualties, either uh, to State Department personnel there uh, or American citizens writ large, and certainly no coalition forces were. were New York Times is reporting about it. What? New York Times is reporting about it. I, I can just tell you what reporting I have here, okay. which is that there were no American citizens, no coalition forces injured in the attack. Now, if that changes over time, certainly we'll, you know, we'll correct it. But as of right now. Uh, the indications I have are no Americans were injured or involved in this attack. Do you think the U.S. has a, a faith and trust in the current system in Afghanistan? Because many uh, civilians in Afghanistan, uh, they are saying that they, have, they are still waiting, that maybe outside help will help them to keep secure Afghanistan. Uh, what I'm asking you is that uh, uh, this, you think what is the future of Afghanistan? And you think uh, again that uh, outside forces or international security will be called in to establish the peace? I think I, I, I addressed this you know, when I was talking to Raz. I mean, Afghan national security forces have come up an extraordinarily long way in the last several years in terms of their competence and capability, their battlefield prowess. Uh, their command and control, their ability to sustain themselves. Now, there's still gaps, which is why we have an advise and assist mission there. But they've come a long way, and they've responded well to this violence, R violence which is not atypical for this time of year for the Taliban. Um, the, the, a Afghanistan is, and we tend to forget this sometimes, a sovereign country. And their security forces are, are uh, acting on uh, the, the orders of, of their government, President Ghani. And, um, and they have done they have done well, um, not just in Kabul but elsewhere throughout the country. Uh, there's still some international support there, but eventually, what we all hope to do is get to a point where the defense and security relationship between us and Afghanistan is more normalized, just like we would have with with any other country around the world. And that's the track we're on. And by dint of what we've seen, the Afghan National Security Forces prove capable of doing in you know just the last couple of years, certainly the last several months. I think we're on track and we all feel very good about that. Before, it used to be only Taliban and Al Qaeda, but now they are facing even ISIL. So, how, uh, uh, how long will the international community keep watching because uh, uh, attacks after attacks still happening there? Well, again, nobody said Afghanistan was going to be violence free. Point one. Point two, yes, we know and we're watching and we're certainly concerned about ISIL. Uh, aspirations inside Afghanistan as we see their aspirations elsewhere. Um, that's certainly a concern. President Ghani's made that clear. Um, I know Secretary Kerry has spoken to that, and that's something that we're all focused on. Uh, but, but again, nobody, nobody said and nobody promised that there will be no violence in Afghanistan moving forward. What's critical is uh, how the security forces are able over time to improve their their ability to prevent such violence, and, when, and when they can't prevent it, which we all have to understand is going to be a reality, how they respond to it. And again, I think, uh, it, it, you know, you don't need to take it from me. You can just look at the record over the last year or so, and you can see how well they are responding, and they're and they're getting better every day. Sure. Uh, Bahrain, the decision to uh, go ahead and restore some military assistance. I saw the note. I note that the U.S. has a critical national security interest in maintaining this relationship with Bahrain. But there are numerous human rights activists 
both here in the U.S. and abroad, who were saying this undercuts the U.S.'s ability to hold the Bahraini government accountable for its human rights violations. How do you respond to that? I'd say we believe it's important to recognize that Bahrain has made some progress on human rights reforms and reconciliation uh, since the crackdown in 2011. At the same time, and, we, and we've been very honest about this, Raj, you can look at our human rights report that went out last week. Uh, we don't think that the human rights situation in Bahrain is adequate, um, as the report makes clear. Um, we're continuing to press Bahrain on numerous serious issues, including the recent sentencing of uh, Sheikh Ali Salman. Uh, but again, that said, Bahrain has implemented a number of important reforms, um, including some key recommendations made by the Bahraini Independent Commission uh, of Inquiry. And they recently <coughs> released a number of prisoners, including many who were imprisoned for political activity, as well as the well-known secular pol political society leader, Ibrahim Sharif. So we're going to continue to press our concerns with Bahrain, but we're also going to continue to press on a very important security relationship that, uh, that matters in the region, and certainly, you know, not just the Gulf region, but the Middle East writ large. We saw recently that when the U.S. decided to restore some military assistance to Egypt, that there was a fundamental change in the way that the Egyptians could access military equipment from the U.S., that basically the U.S. is now going to decide what the Egyptians can get. <clears throat> and I may be oversimplifying, but there is that fundamental change in the way the Egyptians can get the equipment. Is anything similar going to happen with the Bahrainis? Or is the U.S. going to be much more scrupulous in saying, okay, only this kind of equipment can go to this particular part of the government and you can't access other types of equipment because of the potential for abuse? Well, I think, well, uh, I think we made clear in the announcement was that the um, security assistance to the Ministry of Defense would be more, would be normalized now, but that restrictions on assistance to the Ministry of Interior would remain. So, uh, so equipment which which will help Bahrain deal with terror threats in the region mm -hmm. to their Ministry of Defense will will now be that that. Foreign military service program will be restored, but restrictions on the Ministry of Interior uh, will remain. And that's to, to make it plain, that's because the Ministry of Interior deals with domestic political issues, domestic strife, domestic crime, and you're trying to head off their ability to use U.S. provided equipment against their own people. Would right. that it, be fair? It, it's because we believe the Ministry of Interior still has a lot more work to do. Uh, in that regard, uh, in terms of, of uh, human rights issues. Uh, the Ministry of Interior will still be held under, under these restrictions. Well, how much, uh, sticking with that one, um, how much is this uh, worth, uh, the, the arms sales? Can you give us a figure? It's difficult to say exactly right now because um, lifting the restrictions uh, uh, that were, you know, what, four years old, um, it doesn't mean that uh, this is, this, material was sort of shrink-wrapped and put in a warehouse somewhere, and now we're just going to go ship it over there. The next step is to have a discussion with Bahraini leaders uh, to determine what their needs are um, inside the Ministry of Defense, what their needs are uh, uh, specifically, and then we'll, we'll deal with it from there. So I can't give you an exact dollar figure on on what this lift is going to be, okay. because we have to get with them. They have to tell us what they so want. So it could be more or less than what? I don't suspect it's going to be more than what we were doing previously, which was about 10 to $15 million a year. I, 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 I do not think it'll be in excess of that. But again, we've got to sit down with their leaders now and determine, now that the restrictions have been lifted, what is it they, they need. And it'll be, it'll comport with the same kinds of uh, material they were getting before, you know, uh, Armored personnel vehicles, uh, MRAPs, Humvees, uh, tow missiles, arms and ammunition, that kind of thing. And then what specifically did you mean by um, specifically categorizing as meaningful progress on those reforms? Um, I mean, is the, the release of prisoners, uh, can you give us yeah. exactly examples that you see as, as meaningful that the Bahrainis have done? Yeah, I think, um, let me just tick off a few here, uh, and I didn't memorize them, so if you'll just bear with me, but uh, uh, some of the recommendations made by the 
uh, Bahraini Independent Commission of Inquiry, uh, which they have implemented now, include establishing institutions to promote accountability, like an ombudsman's office, a special investigative unit uh, for the uh, uh, Ministry of Interior, uh, the National Institution on Human Rights and the Commission on the Rights of Prisoners and Detainees. Um, rebuilding most of the mosques that were destroyed during the 2011 uh, crackdown. Um, construction is completed on 13 of them, significant progress on 14, um, and there's limited progress on three of them due to some zoning issues. Training police in human rights standards, both for all new cadets and continuous learning courses for exiting personnel, and reinstating the vast majority of workers who were dismissed from their jobs in 2011. I, I do want to, so that's some yeah. actual meaningful reform and change. But again, uh, Leslie, we're under no illusions here that there's still work to be done. As, as I said, it's all documented in our human rights report. I mean, we're not, um, you know, we're taking a very clear-eyed approach to this. Is the U.S. satisfied with the Bahrainis' reaction to this decision? I, I would refer you to the Bahrainis for their reaction. I think, uh, again, this was something that was in discussion. And uh, uh, again, we believe this is the right decision for our relationship with Bahrain uh, and for their importance as a partner in the region, but I so, refer you to them. So you're saying that you did inform them that this is how it was going to be of course. moving forward? Of okay. course, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah sure. sure. Sorry for being late. Just to follow up on, on Rosie's uh, sure. uh, issue. So you're saying that while things are not perfect, they have made a lot of improvement, right? They have made certain strides toward I'm and saying, as I said, at the, as I said at the outset, so they've made meaningful reform progress, mm -hmm. but we're under no illusion that there's still work, more work to to do. Where, where, where was that progress made? What, what particular area? I already answered the question. If you check the transcript, you'll see I, I gave a list. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry for being. Yeah. Right, I just want to ask one more on Bahrain. If, anyway, I promise we'll go to you. And I apologize, but yeah. if um, if there's still progress to be made and the things we've seen have been, I mean, establishing commissions is, is great, but it, it's not actual concrete progress. Why now? Why make this decision now? And does it have anything to do with the fact that we are moving towards a deal with Iran that Brain isn't probably very happy about? I would like to disabuse you of the notion that this is somehow tied to the timing of talks with Iran okay. over uh, their nuclear weapons program. Okay. Uh, no connection to that whatsoever. Why now? This is, this is a, I mean, this has been something, as I said to Raj, we've been, been talking about and thinking about for quite some time. Um, and it's, uh, it's a matter of, a, you know, sets of discussions we've had here internally in the United States government um, and with our Bahraini counterparts. And again, we've seen enough progress to know that there's a concerted effort by, Bar by Bahrain and their leaders uh, to make the changes that they need to make in, with, with respect to human rights. But as we've also said, under no illusion that, there is, that there's more work to be done, that there's more change that needs to be affected. So, and that's why the Ministry of Interior will not, there will be no re resumption of uh, assistance for them at this time. Um, so, I mean, this is part of a, you know, every relationship that we have around the world. There's, there's things you agree on, things you don't agree on, things you want to work on, things that, uh, that need to be improved, and this is just part of a process. But okay. it, the, the timing is, is tied to the progress they've made and the discussions we've had, the comfort level that we feel on restoring some of this assistance. Um, and as I said at the outset, that there's still some discomfort with restoring all of it. Yes, I, I, and I, I promise this young lady, I've got to go to her. Go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll, give, I'll talk to you about the STEM regulation plan. Uh, yesterday, on uh, Okinawa's Board of Education announced that the stone which is found at uh, the Henoko Bay Camp Shrub Seaside is a cultural asset. The stone is, was used by the ship sinker during Ryukyu Kingdom. And uh, Nago City wanted to request the investigations to uh, Henoko Bay, which uh, the construction U.S. Uh, and, and the Japanese government constructing new air base place, and the, by uh, the cultural property uh, perfection law. And that there is a possible uh, 
the possibility that the contraction is the behind the schedule by the fund uh, cultural asset. How do you, United States government think, think about that? I need a comment about that. Uh, you're going to have to give me some time to get you a comment on that one. Um, I'm, I'm simply not uh, up to speed as much on, this, on the construction delays that you're speaking about to speak with any authority. So I'm going to have to take that question and we'll get you an answer back. Yeah. Um, what controls are there on any possible transfer between the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Interior of uh, Equipment? Well, again, these, these articles are, are uh, being resumed for the sales, resumed for the Ministry of Defense and only for the Ministry of Defense, and that's been made clear from the outset. That, uh, but presumably it, the two ministries could exchange or route they are, they are, the, the agreement to lift the restrictions are, is contingent on the fact that it's only for the Ministry of Defense. Yeah. Uh, do you have a readout of the meeting that the Indian Foreign Secretary S. Jayashankar had in the building yesterday, including that with the Deputy Secretary? I'm sorry, who, 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 who? Uh, India's Foreign Secretary was here in this building yesterday and he had a couple of meetings. Do you have a readout? I don't. Who no. we met and what I, all the I, issues we discussed? I don't. I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Turkey today moved 32 additional tanks and armored vehicles to the Syrian border, considered to be used in a safe zone inside of Syria. And yesterday it is said that Turkey didn't inform the United States about a secure zone in, inside of Syria. Didn't Turkey still inform you about her intentions about the secure zone yet? The question, the way you phrase it, makes it sound like, you know, Turkey's made this decision and they're implementing it. Um, so I, you know, you need to talk to the people in Ankara about the decisions that they're making and what they're doing. Uh, uh, the, the, the issue writ large, the interest uh, by Turkey and Turkish leaders in a buffer zone, if you will, which may or may not include a no-fly zone, is something that you know, they've made very clear um, uh, over many, many months now. Um, and this is, a, you know, but I would point you to them to speak to, you know, their desires or their plans. I'm not aware, we're not aware of any plans that they might have for that, specific, you know, military plans for that. Uh, and I would let the U.S. military speak for the complications and the difficulties in any kind of U.S. support for that kind of plan. But again, you, you should I'm, refer, refer I to I did ask anchor. about that because there was a report today on Aksham Daily uh, saying that Secretary Kerry was informed by uh, Turkish FM Çavuşoğlu about the secure zone. He even invited Turkish, uh, American authorities to join those kind of establishment of a secure zone inside of Syria. He was invited when? Uh, last week during the phone talk. They, they uh, talked about a broad range of issues. Um, again, this is not a, the, this interest by Turkey in a buffer zone is not new. Um, and it's something that comes up all the time in conversations. Again, you, you should talk to Turkish leaders about what their plans are and, uh, uh, and if, if they intend to do that. The U.S. military, and again, I'm not speaking for the Pentagon, but they've made it clear that, uh, that uh, right now they don't, there, there isn't a need for it from a U.S. military or coalition perspective, um, and that there are difficulties in trying to uh, to execute that kind of thing. Yeah, I know this is a hypothetical, but if Turkey were to try to establish some sort of buffer zone, or if Jordan were to try to do something similar because of all the instability inside Syria, would that require any sort of approval from the U.N. Security Council? Why, why not? I'm not an expert on UN uh, Security Council procedure. Um, these are th this issue of Jordan, whether they are going to do it or they're not going to do it, or Turkey's going to do it. Or these are those are national decisions that, as far as I know, haven't been made yet by those governments. And if it were to be made, and I hate getting the hypotheticals, right. they would have to decide how they would both make the decision, defend the decision, and implement it. Um, that's you know that's a national. That's a, a national decision that they would have to speak to. I, I don't know that there would be a role for the UN, but again, I'm not a, well, I'm not a procedural well, expert well, on the UN we're talking about establishing some sort of buffer zone inside another country's territory. I, I understand. Yeah. Is it that? No, I, I, get the, that I, get yeah. the, I get the fact that we're talking about a cross-border, but again, this mm -hmm. is something, first of all, I mean, it is hypothetical, been, but, you know, it is worth asking, because I'm thinking of the experience that the U.S. had in Iraq in the 1990s, there were U.N. Security Council yeah, provisions. I don't know what role the U.N. Point. would play. Right. Clearly, yeah. the coalition would, you know, should a country want to move forward on that, the, um, I'm sure that the coalition and coalition members would have a view. Mm -hmm. I can't speak for 
what those views might be in light of decisions that haven't been made yet. I mean, right. it, it is very hypothetical at this point. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, as far as I'd go is what I've said before with respect to the buffer zone that Turkey has talked about in the past. That's not new. Right. And the Defense Department's made it clear that, that, that they don't believe there's a need for that at, mm -hmm. at this time. And that should the, should coalition military assets, you know, that that the use of coalition military assets in trying to affect an, a zone like that would you know would would entail an awful lot mm -hmm. in terms of logistics, time, resources, and effort. What is the uh, thinking inside this building? I know that the effort has been on trying to train moderate Syrian rebels to be capable of fighting ISIL, but have there been any discussions about whether from a policy standpoint, having some sort of buffer zone between part of Syria and Turkey would be an advisable situation. I, I've, um, again, I, you know, Raj, you're, you're really getting into hypotheticals here. I, um, it, no, I'm it, asking just about have there been discussions about a buffer zone? Yes, Turkey has been asking for this for the better part of the past year. As I, no, as I said, I mean, this is something that we've, uh, that, that has certainly been discussed mm -hmm. um, over the last year or so. Um, and uh, but, but there's been no decisions made. And so um, I wouldn't talk about private diplomatic conversations that we may or may not be having with Turkey over it. Mm -hmm. It's something that they've made plain that they're interested in. Um, it's something that the coalition has thus far not been interested in supporting. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and again, you know, the discussions continue, and I just I don't think I'd go beyond that right right now. I, I think it's also important to note, and, and we've all been honest about this, that mm -hmm. we understand the, the concerns that Turkey has about that border, mm -hmm. um, and they are doing an awful lot to accommodate thousands and thousands and thousands of of refugees. They also have a and they're and they're mindful of the challenge they have about a foreign fighter flow right. across that border. So so it's not like. I mean, no, nobody's turning a blind eye to the challenge that they're facing right. or, that, or that the concerns that they have. But again, I just don't want to get ahead of decisions that haven't been made. And I certainly am not going to detail discussions that are, that are, that are ongoing. And just to follow up on, on that, what is the difference from your military expertise between a buffer zone and a safe haven? Because also they talk about a safe haven for refugees. What would be the difference between a buffer zone and a safe haven? Well, I, I don't think in, in, military. in military terms, I'm not sure that there's technical definitions for okay. either one. And I think it depends on the context in which you're using it, Saeed. So yeah. I, I, I don't know that there's much. It depends on how you're, you know, what, how you define it and how you want that area defended and protected. Um, but I, I don't know that there's a, I've never seen a technical military definition difference between, between the two. Mm -hmm. Are the Turks uh, sort of frustrated? with the level or the pace of the train and equip program that you are sort of directing with, with the, I guess, uh, the moderate Syrian uh, rebel group? Or you should ask the Turks. Um, Better Yemen? Sure. Um, do you have a reaction to the uh, ISIS's claim of responsibility for the car bomb attack that killed 28 people in, uh, uh, in Sana? You know, I've seen the reports that they've claimed it, but uh, can't confirm it at this time. Do you have any, what's the level of concern about the seeming, the apparent uh, increase in the level of activity by ISIS in, in Yemen in, in recent It's months? the same, I mean, look, we, I've said this before, we remain concerned about uh, the, uh, the desire by ISIL to metastasize um, and to spread you know, beyond Iraq and Syria, which is the principal front right now. Um, so while I can't, attribute any veracity to the claims that they had anything to do with that or any other of the recent terrorist attacks outside of Iraq and Syria. Certainly we know they have those ambitions and those aspirations. Um, and that concerns us all deeply. And it's why we take so seriously the threat and the challenge of foreign fighters and self-radicalized individuals that can come or go um, with, the, with various passports and visas. There, there are some who say that U.S. tactics uh, in the region um, fighting against uh, AQAP, for instance, have created a sort of vacuum or a space that has allowed ISIS to, to go in and set up more of a presence in, in the country. How would you respond to that? I, I would refute the, the premise that, I mean, the, the pressure we're putting on terror networks around the world has produced results. 
there has been progress again, certainly Al Qaeda and its senior leadership, but other other elements as well. Um, and I, I don't. I think it's not this perceived growth of ISIL, and I use the word perceived uh, deliberately. Um, is uh, could, you know, who knows exactly what's behind it, but it, it's just as much about branding and aspirations um, as it is anything else. It doesn't mean we don't take it seriously. It doesn't mean we're not uh, trying to adapt to the, to the threat that they pose. But to suggest that, um, that the work, that the counterterrorism work that we're doing has created ungoverned spaces or space for these guys to grow, I just, I, I would challenge that. But are you able to, you know, assuming that there is a, a level of reality to the threat in Yemen, are you able to adapt to that without, you know, without much of a presence there on the ground given the conflict? I, our effort in Yemen, I think, and this gets to the, what, what really needs to happen in places like Yemen, Iraq, and Syria, um, and quite frankly, Libya as well, is good governance, responsive governance. And I know that that's a difficult thing to wrap your brain around, and it's not something that's, you know, tangible, uh, but it is, it is in effect what is the long-term solution here. Because these guys, you know, uh, you, we talk about their slick propaganda machine, and the, they, there is an allure to a certain segment of particularly young men out there. Um, but, to, but to paint these guys as 10 feet tall and, you know, ultra popular around the world would be ridiculous. It's ludicrous. Uh, they're not invincible. They're not 10 feet tall, and they're going to fail. Um, but it's going to take some time. And one of, the, one of the ways you get at the threat, aside from kinetics, which we're very good at, and they continue to lose fighters, they continue to lose equipment, they continue to lose ground, um, they're able to sustain themselves and, and to recruit and, and survive, and we recognize that. One of the reasons they're able to do that is because of the, this, this popular ideology. But they will eventually, over time, uh, they will be defeated. And, they'll, and it, it won't just be through kinetic military action, it'll be through good governance. And that's what the political solutions in places like Yemen and Libya, uh, th that's the real answer. And that's harder to get at. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I guess my question was really how, you know, how much the U.S. can contribute to that without the kind of um, presence on the ground that you, that you used to have. That you don't contribute have. to good governance. Yeah. Well, we're, we're well, building a, for, you know, um, durable kind of political solution. Well. The lack of presence on the ground affects you more from a military perspective than it does from a, a governance perspective. As you know, in uh, in Libya uh, and in Yemen, there's there's UN-led uh, processes here to try to come to political resolutions, which we are very much in support of. Uh, and so I think you know that we believe is the right approach. It's the right mechanism to try to do this. Now we also note that there's been some challenges in these in both sets of of, uh, of talks. Uh, but we fully support that as the as the way forward. Can I go? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Leslie. Can I go? Yeah. Um, I want to go, turn to Greece. I know that, um, that the Treasury is in charge of looking at the economic issues, but from this building, you're in, you look over the geopolitical um, risks of what's what's going on. Greece is on the the, the edge of a default, um, which could have political regional repercussions, um, what is this building doing or people in this building doing to encourage them to, uh, to encourage um, the Europeans to either extend the talks? Because Merkel said today she says, no, there's no more talk. Um, or what you, are you doing within the International Monetary Fund, of which the U.S. is the largest shareholder, to try to also press from that side um, for more uh, leniency with, with the Greeks? Well, one, we're carefully monitoring the situation. Um, uh, this is something that certainly Secretary Kerry um, has been watching closely. Secretary Liu, as you rightly pointed out, senior Treasury officials in the White House are in close touch with a broad array of, or broad array of our counterparts on the situation, uh, to include officials from Greece, the European Union, and the IMF. Uh, I think you heard the President speak to this today, and how he's closely watch watching this process, and he cited the Secretary Liu's work as well. Um, from here at the State Department, we continue to believe it's important that all sides work together uh, to get back to a path that's going to allow Greece to resume reforms uh, and to return to growth within the, within the Eurozone. Uh, but again, we're monitoring this very closely. So it sounds like you don't believe that Greece should leave the Eurozone. Uh, it, look, what we believe is that all sides need to work towards a, a path where 
uh, again, Greece can execute the, uh, uh, resume the reforms uh, that it needs to do and uh, to return to growth within the Eurozone. Are there any concerns about geopolitical issues like Greece's ability to handle refugee flows from the Middle East and North Africa or bases that we have on Crete? I mean, if the country becomes less stable, is there any concern in this building about those issues? I mean, I think our concerns about, uh, you know, whether Greece or across a broad range of issues. Um, uh, but again, this is, I want to keep going back to this is something for the Greek leaders to work out with our European partners uh, and the IMF. And I, I don't think I want to go beyond that. Yeah. Um, one clarification, the 3,000 pages of emails um, that will be released tonight, are they all going to be related to the Benghazi attack? And then the second question is the new special envoy for Guantanamo closure. Do you happen to know when's the last time he visited the facility? And also if there's any conversations with senators like John McCain on this topic? Okay, there's a lot there. Um, yeah. Good to see you again, by the Me way. Um, the, remember, there's two processes going on here. The, the release of the emails tonight, as I said, roughly, roughly correspond to about March to December of 2009. And they cover a wide swath of issues. I'll let you look at them tonight, and you can see that uh, uh, the content is not at all, it's not driven by the Benghazi Select Committee's work. That is a separate and distinct process that we are also trying to support and cooperate with. The emails that are being released tonight are in, are in keeping with the court ruling that we do a rolling production of these 55,000 pages of, of traffic. Um, on uh, Mr. Woloski's last trip to Gitmo, I, I don't know. I'd have to get that. I mean, he just got, we just announced him today. So, I mean, he may never have gone for all I know. I'm going to have to look and see if he's ever made a trip down there. Um, again, today was the announcement. Um, and then your third one was? Any conversations with Senator John McCain or others who've been really active on this issue on, on Guantanamo? Well, um, certainly we consulted members of Congress uh, about okay. Secretary Kerry's decision to uh, announce Mr. Woleski for, for the job. I mean, that was done in, in concert with, as we always do, with, with members of Congress. Yeah, Lucas. John, just going back to Iran for a second, why are, is the U.S. government not demanding that Iran release the American hostages being held by the regime? Why are we not demanding that Iran release the American hostages being held right now? I think you, I mean, the President spoke to this pretty forcibly today. I mean, this is something we routinely bring up on the sidelines of discussions on other issues like, like the nuclear deal. Well, why the sidelines? Why not make it a red line and say we're not going forward until you... We've do. long said that we're not going to link. They should be released because they should be released. And we're not going to tie that to the nuclear deal. That's long been Secretary Kerry's and this and this government's policy. They need to be released because they need to be released. And um, and and you know, it, just on the face of it, and it's something we routinely discuss with Iranian leaders. As the president said today, as Secretary Kerry has said before, uh, our focus has never turned away from their plight, the way they're being treated, uh, and their detention. But it is a separate and distinct um, issue. As, are, as there are many others that we work with with Iran and disagreements we have with Iran, separate and distinct from this nuclear deal. This, this nuclear deal, the discussion, is about stemming their ability to ever achieve a nuclear weapons capability. But is not um, I thought there was a statement yesterday that uh, Secretary Kerry raised the issue during the discussions yesterday. It's something, as I said, on, this, on the sidelines, any time we engage with Iranian leaders, um, we make sure we raise this issue. But it is, it is raised separate and distinct from and not connected to the negotiations over well, why the is nuclear it? Why not link it? The, they, because, as I said, Lucas, I mean, I don't know if I can say it. I'll say it again. It's going to be the same. They should be released because they should be released. They should be home with their families. Um, and, um, uh, and certainly, and we've spoken to this too, that the... the the conditions under which they're they're being detained. So this wasn't a decision of the supreme leader saying this is not negotiable. No, this is this is our policy that they need to be released uh, by dint of the fact that they're they're uh, not being detained with due process. They should be home with their families, and we're going to continue to work to that end. But it is a separate and distinct discussion from the nuclear deal. I got time for one more. Thank you, sir. Um, just my uh, uh, quick uh, comment, sir. There's a 
blame game going on between India and Pakistan as far as terrorism is concerned. My question is, last week uh, India brought some proofs that uh, why Pakistan uh, freed uh, Lakhvi, who was involved in Mumbai attacks and all that, for 166 people were kill killed, including six uh, foreigners. And uh, there was a question at the you know, uh, UN Security Council, but uh, China uh, vetoed. And China said there's a, uh, not enough uh, proofs. But now there are demonstrations uh, in the, uh, uh, among the human rights groups, and they are saying now China is also supporting terrorism when they vetoed at the UN that uh, not enough evidence that India provided as far as uh, Lakhvi and others uh, supported by Pakistan. Any comments on this, uh, you, uh, China's involvement now that uh, favoring uh, Pakistan on I terrorism? I haven't seen uh, all those reports, uh, Goyal, but I think, you know, our position hasn't changed that, you know, we want tensions between India and Pakistan to be reduced. We want them to work uh, together bilaterally to resolve some of these differences. I just haven't seen the, I haven't seen the, 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 comments that you're referring to with respect to China and the UN. So. And final comment, just uh, last week also Foreign Secretary of Pakistan was here and uh, he was speaking at Atlantic Council and he said that he has proofs against India. India is supporting terrorism <laughs> against Pakistan. So has he provided any proofs here at the State Department which he said he will be giving to the State Department? I'm not aware of any such <laughs> okay. delivery. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, sir. Yep.